ladies and gentlemen here present and um, on Zoom, welcome. Let me start by introducing the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, the one Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to our elders past and present. Given the topic that we're addressing tonight, this recognition and respect, and I use emphasize the second word, is very important. The topic tonight, um, which I hope will further progress the bringing together of uh, the, uh, knowledge in particular, and our mutual respect is obviously important. We're talking about biodiversity and we're talking about sustainable food production. These things matter. Um, Beck and I were sent something earlier today which pointed out that if you take the biomass of all the mammals on land in the planet, 95% of those is cattle. Now, is that a good thing? Probably not. Is it sustainable? Probably not. So, um, the purpose is to explore a few things from different angles today, and I'm not going to take um, more than a few seconds of time. Let me introduce our speakers in the order. Um, Dr. Beck Spindler, who uh, is, I'm sorry, I'll take it that you've all read the um, introductions, uh, who leads science and conservation at Bush Heritage. Uh, Oliver Costello, who is a proud, Burund sorry, I got that wrong, uh, Bajalan man, am I right? From the Northern Rivers, and Rich Eckhart, Professor Rich Eckhart. Uh, from here, I'm going to hand over to um, our own Janice Cocking, who will be your guide for the rest of the evening until we break for dinner. Janice, please go. Well, good evening, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to this session today. Uh, what we will do is, is, is have three presentations and then a discussion session. So that's 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 the idea for this for this <coughs> evening. And uh, and let us start really by welcoming uh, uh, Rebecca to come and speak to us about Bush Heritage. Thank you so much, Alexander and Janice. I'm actually going to ask Ol to stand up here with me because the, <laughs> this is going. The first half is really going to be a joint presentation. We're going to tell you a little bit about Bush Heritage and how it works. And then we're going to tell you about a specific project that Ol is running for Bush Heritage and, and Melbourne University, specifically to address a couple of the issues that we're going to bring up. Before I do that, though, I would also like to, to recognise that I stand on Wurundjeri land, what is, what is, was, always, will be a Wurundjeri land, land that was never ceded. And as I stand on Australian soil, I stand on Aboriginal land wherever I am in this, in this gorgeous country. And what a privilege it is to work for Bush Heritage and play a small role in this fabulous organisation that is really about protecting this very large landscape. This is critically important globally that we do the conservation work that we do across Australia because we are both mega diverse and we are highly endemic. A number of the vast proportions of our species across Australia are found only here which means if we lose them from here, there is no option B. We lose them from the entire planet. And as you can see, birds, because obviously they have the ability for flight, are about 46% endemic. 46% of our species are found nowhere else in the world. That changes a little bit when we start looking at some of the more sedentary species. Amphibians, the flowering plants, reptiles, are all above 90% endemic. It's an incredibly unique landscape and incredibly unique suite of species that we're trying to protect. And the, the sweet little um, honey possum over on the right there 
hugging onto a bank's ear is absolutely emblematic of this. This is the only place in the world, this photo was taken in the Fitzsterling Ranges in the southwest of Western Australia, and a unique biodiversity hotspot, the only place in the world when mammal pollinators could have evolved. Just think about the amount of nectar you need to support a body that is a mammal. It's pretty easy as a, as a fly, as a bee, as a something that flits from one flower to another to collect enough pollen to survive to the next day, to the next week. For a mammal to have enough ne nectar to survive from week to week to week to week, something needs to be flowering all the time. Think of the diversity that you need to have in the flowering plants that absolutely without fail provides that kind of nectar and that, that diversity and that assurance of that flowering all the way through every single year. All you need is no plants flowering for a couple of weeks and that species is gone. All we need to lose is 20% of that biodiversity and those mammal pollinators, the only place mammal pollinators are found anywhere in the world, are gone. So it's critically important that this is what we do. And bush heritage plays a significant role specifically in filling the gaps. As a nation, Australia has done quite well in terms of addressing our previous global biodiversity framework um, agreements around 17% protected area with comprehensiveness and representativeness of, of ecosystems. We smashed the extent. We're up to 19% already. In fact, we were up to 19%. We're probably more now of extent of, of the landscape across Australia protected. What we have is a lot of desert and a lot of rainforest. We do not have that diversity of landscape. We don't have every single ecosystem by a long shot. Do we not have every single ecosystem represented in the private and public protected area network? That's a, that's a role that Bush Heritage has taken on very seriously. So we've identified through our priority landscapes areas that are representative habitats that are not yet well enough represented, not well, well enough protected in this protected area network. We also recognise areas that are still of good condition and probably going to be resilient to climate change. And they're what we call, they're in the brown um, areas there, they're what we call our resilient landscapes. And that's where we're actively looking to expand our influence to make sure that the critical landscapes that really need to be protected and that are in good condition are still um, able to, to be able to do that. We're able to either acquire those lands or we're able to partner with people to be able to protect that. The green areas are the areas where we need to fill in. We need to undertake active restoration to build back the strength and resilience in those landscapes. And then finally in the blue are the areas that are going to see significant impacts with climate change or have habitats that are on the edge. They have a, a decent amount that are already protected. And really what we're trying to do in those landscapes is shore up our existing properties, our existing partnerships, and make sure that they have the greatest chance of continuing that role of conservation across Australia. This is what it looks like already. This is where we have already protected um, either through our own acquisition um, and, and our reserves are represented in the red dots there. Our partnerships with Aboriginal people are represented in the blue dots and that shows no scale, which is, which is a bit of a shame because 30% of Australia is already managed through Indigenous protected areas and, and this doesn't demonstrate that particularly well but it gives you a bit of an idea of the locations. And we further have regional um, partnerships that are dotted throughout the landscape. We have a large number of growing partnerships with agricultural industry that aren't yet represented on this map, but we will mention briefly later on. Regardless of where we're working and through which we call them impact models, so whether it's ownership or partnership or through influence, we always work as closely as we possibly can with the traditional owners. We try and we're now succeeding in, in the last couple of years in having our traditional owners join us in planning meetings to make sure that we understand their aspirations, that we share our knowledge and, and recognise, respect and protect their knowledge as much as we possibly can in building that planning. And we understand what they want to do. We understand what they want to see us do. And we understand what they don't want to see us do? What are the things that we need to think of a different and better way that's more, more acceptable across these different landscapes? In total, we have about 37 reserves and 30 partnerships. So 17 of those partnerships are on reserve, 
and 13 are, are off reserve on purely Aboriginal held and managed land. On each of these different off reserve partnerships, we work through trust and respect to build that understanding. And this is where the power dynamic is completely flipped. So the owners and managers of these lands, the Aboriginal people and the prescribed body corporates that, that are in charge of these areas are absolutely defining the areas that are critically important, understanding what it is that they need to do and they define for us what role they want us to play in helping to manage these, these gorgeous landscapes. This is a, a photo of Rita Cutter, who is um, an elder out in the Western deserts of Western Australia. And what she doesn't know about bilbies just isn't worth knowing. I could maybe, you could take me to a bilby burrow and I could say, oh yeah, okay, that's a bilby burrow, is it? All right, great. And it looks active. I could maybe give you that. Rita will tell you how many animals are living there, what gender they are, whether they're reproductive and what they ate last night. One of the things that we try very hard to do across our reserves is really take a future focus. And thanks to CSIRO, who have very kindly downloaded terabytes of data and given us back end access to the, all of their climate modelling, we understand deeply what sort of impacts in terms of precipitation and warming are going to occur across each of our different landscapes across the country. Apart from being a little bit shocking and a little bit depressing, that is a wealth of information that we really need to have to be able to be prepared and to better understand what we need to do to protect the things that are critically important. With this climate change information, we've been taking on a much more detailed analysis of our planning to understand the things that are important to us, which are critical to protect in place, which are critical to understand how we need to transition, which are going to transition and how do we guide that transition to make sure the ecosystem's functional and what are we just going to lose and how do we replace the processes and functions that those species, those communities are playing in terms of ecosystem health or, or health of country. This is Nadu Hills down in our Victorian landscape in Riverina Goldfields, where we suffered a significant tree die off uh, in 2015 after a significant drought, obviously it was in the middle of the millennial drought and a, a big jump up. So over five days, there was an increase in temperature of about five degrees, 5.4 degrees on average. That was enough to kill hillsides of trees. And we were not able to recruit um, those yellow box and gray box uh, woodlands back into those areas. And we've taken it on as an experimental approach to try and figure out how we deal most effectively with this kind of impact with climate change. So we've kept the species the same, yellow box and grey box, and we've gone to areas that are already experiencing the kind of temperatures and aridity that we're expecting this area to see in 10, 20, 50, 80 years time. We've brought those genes into the population. We've nursed those trees through the first levels of, of recruitment, first month and even years of recruitment. And those trees are now three years old. They're doing exceptionally well. Some, some uh, provenances are doing exceptionally well, others are not. Every single tree has a QR code. So we're able to go through and identify the individual tree. We know the mother tree from the genetics of that and the QR code tells us where it came from, which seed lot it came from, when it was harvested and what the genetics tells us about the survival or not of that particular tree. We look at the height, we look at the girth and we look at the, the health of the leaves across that tree. This kind of information is obviously helping us understand how well our conservation and our cultural targets are going. So most of the a very similar pattern across a lot of the climate change that we're finding is not only are we getting an overall drying trend, but we're going to have much more severe droughts and then we're going to have floods. We've already started seeing that. I think that's that's pretty clear from our basic observations. That has significant implications for our conservation targets, our ecological target but it also has great consideration for our cultural targets. So many of the culturally important sites, areas and artefacts are around waterways. If we have floods, a drought and then a flood, a lot of that is going to get washed down. So we work very closely with, our, with the traditional owners of the landscapes where we, where we work and particularly that we own to make sure that that's protected, that they're moved into an area that they can be protected or that the traditional owners manage that in a way that's most appropriate. 
We also share this information around climate change and, and understand what the traditional owners are observing themselves. What kinds of changes are they seeing across country? What does that mean for keeping country healthy as well as keeping people healthy? Obviously, the extreme temperatures are, are really difficult and we need to manage that with staff, but we also need to have traditional owners, help traditional owners develop strategies around what they need to do to be safe on country. And we need to understand the change in the range of vectors, disease carrying vectors like mosquitoes and midges and various other bits and pieces. We share all of that information with, our, with the traditional owners to make sure that we're de developing strategies that we can all work with across this area. And sometimes that means moving, and it's an uncomfortable movement for conservation, that MU is, has always thought of the gently, gently approach. You know, we'll, we'll take care of the threats and nature will take care of itself. That's clearly no longer true. We are going to have to take a much more active management style to, to working with the landscapes where, where we, that we own and, and where we partner with other people. We work the land until the land works, which is actually... A, a much it's a, a way of thinking it's a system of thinking that is much more akin to, to aboriginal management traditional management of this country in years gone by one of our first partners was Wanabal Gumbra and uh, the Wanabal Gumbra are up in the the top end of Kimberley they were granted about six over six million hectares of sea and land country up in, near the Mitchell Plateau and, and out into the sea they were actually the very first people to ever develop what we call a healthy country plan. So Bush Heritage uses the international conservation standards where you fundamentally understand what's important to you, you understand the threats to those things, you understand what you need to do about it using all of the best knowledge and, and a, a community-based decision-making process. And then you report on whether you did what you were going to do, whether or not it was effective and, and whether you've reached your ultimate goal. Wanamugumbra took that system and made it their own. And so this is fundamental, this is the basics of their healthy country plan, the very first healthy country plan across Australia. And what you can see here is the key to what's important to them across their country. And you see a number of different processes, but you also see a mix of different things. And this is critical to something that I keep hearing from a lot of my, my Aboriginal friends and advisors. We white fellas put things in boxes. We say this little bit of land is for farming and this little bit of land is for living and this little bit, bit of land is for gardening and conservation and, and other nice things to have. Let's call that culture. So here you can see through the Wanamal Gumbra and the Healthy Country Plan, right way fire is a process and it is absolutely critical to keeping everything healthy, to stopping things from overgrowing, to bringing new fresh pick, green pick for the kangaroos to bring the kangaroos in. Then secondly, you've actually got the kangaroos and wallabies, another value. They're important because it's great to have them around. They're, they're an important part of the ecosystem, but they're also food. So doing what's right for the kangaroos and the wallabies also keeps health country healthy, but it also provides you your food. It's part of that, that farming, that production. Um, Wallu, the rainforest is also not only important to have culturally and as part of your part of your system and part of your landscape, but it's critical for med medicinal foods. It's in, it really important for um, food products really across the way. And then as we go th go down, the message, part of the message that we're trying to get across, I think, is that country is everything. Country is productive. It provides you the needs in terms of food and medicine and water, but it is also part of your family. It is absolutely critical culturally as well as ecologically. So we often talk about conservation and cultural targets. There's an enormous overlap. The vast majority of things that we think are critically important ecologically are also critically important culturally. The, so many of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia have recognised the importance to individual species and communities to build and drive health across these ecosystems. And that's why they're critical to being protected. It's interesting to note that the very first healthy country plan set up by the Wanamal Gumbra have put them in an extraordinarily strong place to take advantage of the economic, environmental economic accounting frameworks. Um, you might, might have heard of accounting for nature that sets a standard so if these things are important to you, 
this is where we think you need to get to for them to be considered healthy. It has a, it has a significant bite on reality and looking at the, the rainforest, that has suffered significant losses and with climate change, there's a limit to how much you can restore that area. So the goal state is basically at fair. Orange means fair. Where are we? We're at fair. Does that mean there's no room to move? No, probably not. There's probably still a little bit more to do. And there's actually quite a lot of work in keeping it at that fair rating. But this gives us an understanding of how well we're progressing across to having a good economic account for that large estate. We are also working, Bush Heritage is also working more and more with the second largest landholder across Australia, which of course is agriculture. 60% of Australia is under agricultural holdings of one sort or another. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is make sure that we provide as much advice. We're not trying to manage the farm. We are not farmers, so we're not telling people how to do that. But we provide as much advice as we possibly can around the biodiversity, how they can protect biodiversity, create corridors, allow movement of biodiversity as much as possible, but also gain the benefits of biodiversity. Bring the, bio, the, the beneficial insects for pollination and for pest management and all of that sort of thing. One of the great things that our um, strategy and growth team have developed is an integrated vegetation method. So this provides a rapid ability to go in and assess the health of vegetation relatively rapidly across a farm. And that gives the, the property manager a fantastic overview of how things are going and how they can improve and, and what they need to do. Through all of this, of course, we're sharing a lot of information. And what's critically important to us as Bush Heritage and many other conservation organisations, as well as many of the traditional owner groups that we work with, of course, is being able to recognise, respect and protect that knowledge. And that's where Conservation Futures came on. We'll go back there. Um, yeah, first, I just want to acknowledge country as well, pay respects to elders past, present and future. The bundling, that's always important. That I just make sure wherever I go that I'm um, honouring the old people. So, yeah. So, yeah, I work um, part-time for Bush Heritage on the Conservation Futures project. And so really Conservation Futures is about creating a knowledge sharing space. Like my background has largely been around cultural fire management. Um, and we've seen with bushfires and, and even more recently, I had a lot of experience around floods and stuff. We're just seeing all these impacts on, on cultural values. And when decision makers are thinking about how do they look after country, how do they, you know, where do they put fire lines and all this sort of thing, there's just a real lack of that cultural knowledge. And also we have ranger groups and IPAs and First Nations custodians, like looking at what are their um, healthy country plans and and where's all that 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 cultural and environmental data out there. So what we're trying to do is being able to make a place that's culturally safe um, to be able to bring that knowledge together because so much of that cultural knowledge um, hasn't been recognised um, and has also been misappropriated. So a lot of cultural knowledge holders are really reluctant to share knowledge with people that they don't trust. And a lot of those cultural knowledge pathways have been broken down through colonisation, through segregation, marginalisation, and people being, you know, told they can only live here and they can only do this. And so lots of that knowledge has been um, deteriorated in some areas lost. Um, but also a lot of that knowledge still exists in the landscape because that's where the knowledge came from. You know, like first people, first people to learn that knowledge, first people to maintain that, that knowledge and that practice. And we can become first people again by being able to get back out into our landscapes and build that knowledge. And so, you know, Conservation Futures is about creating a space for that, where we can pull together all the knowledge that's in the community, in the archives, and also put that cultural context, you know, around the environmental knowledge. And also it's for, you know, all sorts of different knowledge as well. Like I've got to focus on the cultural knowledge, you know, and I really want to be able to understand the um, the different, yeah, like things, the different layers. So here's a bit of an example of those different types of information, you know, that we're, we're just building the system. So a lot of our work's been looking at how you build it, a, a, make it a safe place that people want to share, you know, so it's, um, we can get all that rich, you know, and so a lot of the, the data that we're trying to bring in already exists. It's a lot of it's already out there, um, but it's in all these different systems, you know, and it's hard to see in one place. And the decision makers, that I guess, a lot of the um, work we're trying to look at is, you know, cultural land managers, land holders, you know, like, I guess, organisations that don't have, I guess, a lot of um, database and mapping capability. So make it easy for them to be able to like have access to the same information that a lot of other decision makers have um, in one place, but also create a place for 
sharing that that harder stuff, the stuff you can't find on the internet, the stuff that you actually have to go on. And I know this firsthand from my own like learning that I've done, you know, on country learning, you know, and been really fortunate to to work in lots of parts of um, even down here, work with um Wurundjeri people, you know, learning and teaching about cultural fire and. So being able to be exposed to that richness of knowledge in the landscape um, and then see maps and there's just nothing there, there's just nowhere to find. And so being able to kind of create a space where we can show that there's knowledge, but also recognise that um, that, it's, that there's protocols that need to be set, set up in how we access the information in a digital sense, but also how we access that information in a real sense around relationships. And so it's trying to, you know, like harmonise and, and really just bring, bring us together. So... We're using a digital platform, but really it's about being on country. It's about understanding that all these, you know, all these maps, all these values, all these bits of data, they all relate to somewhere, you know, and being able to kind of create a pathway to build those relationships is really important so we can help improve the decision making. You know, there's seen, you know, I've seen firsthand a lot of really great intentions, people wanting to do really good things. Um, and I've seen a really lot of poor outcomes for that because, haven't, you know, haven't talked to the local um, knowledge holders, First Nations people, farmers, other conservation, you know, like other people that are in that landscape and um, have that knowledge not being talked to because they don't exist in the systems. They don't know, people don't know how to talk to. So it's, it's also like trying to connect people um, to that place. So here's an example of um, one of our case studies. Um, down, this is down at uh, Yambala. Um, Yambala is a private land holding um it's a you know a, i guess a legacy um property you know been passed down for generations um from the first settlement um and the landholder there i guess really you know wants to um look at how that land can be restored he's done a lot of work um dealing with blackberry and other weeds and stuff like that and really and and is really trying to open up that property to you know make it a productive and viable um, place to be able to um you know grow food and fiber but also share share culture. So black duck foods. Um, Uncle Bruce Pascoe's there, and um, and some of the other black duck foods um, team. They've been going to to Yambala and and burning with his uh, spontaneous combustion here with <laughs> out um, just seeing whether it's ready to go. Um, and 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 just um, with burning and and harvesting grain and looking at how do you uh, increase that um, natural resource productivity. You know, like when uh, first settlers came here. Landscape was really good. It was really healthy. Our old people had developed a really um, profound understanding of their res re the reciprocity that's important to live in a landscape, um, and and you know how how we burn and how we move and protocols about what we can and can't take in different parts of the landscape, you know, like protected area management, um, all that knowledge, you know. Um, and so landscapes were really productive. They had lots of food and fiber, you know, and we've seen. Um, lots of those landscapes deteriorate and I guess here's an you know this is an opportunity for us to understand how we can heal some of that damage and help create economic you know pathways um, you know old people didn't didn't have 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 money um, they had food fiber knowledge that's how you know when you know that's how um, that economy um, worked you know and so being able to how do we relate that to a modern economy how do we make sure that we've got all that food and fiber and and and, and you know and and you know work out really important pathways and so this is a little just example of I guess trying to understand what some of those values are um, how we make sure that you know local um, cultural knowledge holders are involved um, and leading um, that process around determining what those values are what sort of data goes into the system what sort of data doesn't this that stuff's important cultural information it belongs to people in country we don't need to put it in a system but what what can we share from that how can we identify who those knowledge holders are or what are appropriate um, values and you know like practices for there you know and so how do we how do we kind of make sure the system's telling these stories you know so probably yeah. if I can just tell two stories about that particular ground it really was spontaneous totally. uh, yeah. Uncle, Uncle Bruce said close, close to the microphone. sorry <laughs> I'll just tell tales on all so for those of you who haven't read Ollie started fire sticks and has an, an incredible <laughs> wealth of knowledge around um, cultural burning and the and the the good it does country and Bruce Pascoe walked over to Ol and said this looks a bit dry and I said oh you know, <laughs> should I should I do something about it magically matches appeared from nowhere and all of a sudden they were burning and you could as soon as the fire had been through 
seconds after you could you could put your hand on it it was an absolutely cool burn it, there was it wasn't doing anything but taking off that top layer and the next morning there were kangaroos everywhere and it was just such a, a perfect illustration of everything I've read in Dark Emu and so many of the other scripts it was it was absolutely perfect I think we'll we will leave it there um but really just to say that we're regardless of what we're doing regardless of who we're working with that fundamental trust and respect that we're all working towards keeping healthy, keeping country healthy. And the only way we're going to do that is together. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for, for, for that introduction from, from one aspect. And now we have our third speaker, Richard Carr, who's going to talk to us from the other. Thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity and uh, great to meet up again. Uh, Rebecca and Oliver and I were in the uh, Alice Springs in July last year. Mm -hmm. um, we coordinated the Desert Song Festival, um, which was a climate symposium, but we called it a climate yarning circle where we were trying to bring traditional knowledge about climate together with climate science. So we had the likes of David Caroli there talking with traditional owners and trying to align the two, which there's no inconsistency between those messages. So, um, so firstly, I need to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future, but noting that they were the custodians of the biodiversity of the original land um, and had managed it for thousands of years before the colonials arrived. Um, so my, my background is, is strongly in sustainable agriculture, agricultural systems, um, but with a focus towards climate change and how uh, agriculture will be impacted by changing climate, but also how agriculture is impacting on the climate. So that's the work that, that I, I, I do. So forgive me if my entry point into the discussion around biodiversity is actually starts with an agricultural lens, um, but very quickly sort of, points out that, that it's time for us to move beyond this rather myopic and um, focused lens on carbon in the landscape through to a more broader focus on biodiversity because, well, all organic material is 46% carbon anyway. Um, so why are we talking about carbon in isolation of the broader biodiversity it confers into the landscape? Um, so I'll, I'll start with a sort of an agricultural perspective, but we talk of Australia being a lucky country and we are in many respects, but one area where we ran out of luck was in rainfall variability. So Australia is about 22% more rainfall variable than the next nearest country in the world, which is the southern tip of Africa, which is 11% more climate variable than any other country in the world. So we kind of start 30% 30, 30 plus behind in rainfall variability uh, in the first place. And then you add climate change into that, which adds more complexity into this variable climate that you're dealing with. So we started a long way behind and climate change is providing a challenge to that. But then you start looking at the Australian native ecosystem and the landscape and you start seeing the natural adaptations that existed for millennia in the landscape to cope with that variable climate. Uh, so we bring in European farming systems and we wonder why they fall over. Um, I'll, I'll just quote some examples. You might have heard me quote them um, at that, that evening session in Alice Springs, but but it just strikes me, there's a couple of key adaptations. You talk about embryonic diapause in marsupials. So what that really means is an adaptation to synchronize the birth of the offspring to favorable conditions, irrespective of when mating took place. So these animals are able to be pregnant and hold onto the fetus, so the embryo, until the environment is favorable for, for birth. Uh, what an adaptation to a variable climate. I mean, that, that that's amazing. Another one that's really gripped my imagination is um, Thamida triandra, kangaroo grass. You find it native on the slopes of Mount Wellington in Hobart. It grows about 30 centimetres tall there at maturity. You go to the Kimberley and you find the same genus and species growing in the Kimberley and it grows two metres tall. What an adaptation. It grows all the way up through the whole continent from temperate winter rainfall climates, cool temperate winter rainfall, all the way up to true tropical summer dominant rainfall. Um, and as just an anecdote, as PhD students, we had this experiment where we swapped the seed around and they grew low, true to local types. So actually, while there's 
um, genetic diversity within that population, actually the two meter plant planted on the slopes of Mount Wellington will grow 30 centimeters tall. Um, now you compare that to our introduced European grasses like perennial ryegrass. We've done some modeling around the dairy industry and are pretty confident that by 2050, perennial ryegrass will no longer be the mainstay of the dairy industry because it can't handle that shift in temperature. You throw that same temperature shift at Thamida triandra or kangaroo grass and see that it probably will cope with that temperature range. Um, but uh, then, then I don't know if you went out to the gorge in Alice Springs with the, the ranger and um, what was his name, uh, Greg, with it. Uh, anyway, um, and he explained how Doug. fish, Doug. Doug, Doug, that's right. Um, and he explained to us how fish like the, uh, the, the hardy spangled grunter survives in these non-perennial waters that dry up completely. The fish all die out, but the eggs are buried deep in the mud and the next rainfall, they come out and they replicate again and off they go. I mean, just amazing that fish can survive in a, um, a non-perennial water source. And then I think you touched on fire. Uh, we know that the African ecosystem, the Australian ecosystem is designed for fire. It, it's adapted to fire. Eucalyptus, the Themida species, a lot of plant species require fire to reproduce. Um, so that's another adaptation we see. Um, put fire into perennial ryegrass and you will reseed it. Um, so, um, so I guess it brings me to the point that we, we did take a very European centric view um, of the world when the early colonists came to Australia and seem to have had the mindset of we'll tame this landscape and make it look like Europe. And then we wonder why we pay drought subsidies and flood subsidies in the same 12 month period, uh, because we've got systems that don't suit the ecosystem we're trying to manage in. Um, and now we've got climate change thrown into that mix that increases that variability. Um, and to my own sort of shame, I, I think we know a lot about how wheat will be affected by climate change. We've published papers on that. We've published papers on how ryegrass will be affected and how our dairy cows will be affected. But I think comparatively, we know very little about how native ecosystems will be challenged. But there's, there's some reports around that snow guns can't go further up the slopes because they've got as far as they can get. Um, but I, I think to, to your talk, we don't know enough about how the native ecosystems are going to respond to a changing climate. Um, and um, <clears throat> so climate change really has put a stake in the ground for us and said, you can't keep going like you have. You've got to, you've got to think about how you are going to adapt this system. Um, so in general, in general principles, uh, adapting a system to a more variable climate requires diversification rather than intensification. And so in the Australian landscape, we might have to see a future where intensification of agriculture can only take place in the areas of low climate variability. So we're talking about just the back of the Otways, maybe around Coffs Harbour, maybe around uh, somewhere south of Cairns where, where variability is low. But the moment you go inland, uh, diversification has to be the name of the game. And that leads you to a discussion around biodiversity as being a broad principle of how agriculture is going to have to respond. And so we've seen some uh, terminologies come into agriculture to try and address some of this issue like conservation agriculture, uh, climate smart agriculture, um, sustainable intensification is one. Um, carbon farming is another term that's come in. Uh, someone earlier mentioned regenerative agriculture. That's another term that's come in as attempts to try and describe how we need to uh, restore the land and move forward. But one thing that came out of the Alice Springs story, um, I heard a statement there that we are still taking a colonial view of adaptation. And it was a real challenge to me in the work we do that are we still taking a colonial view of adaptation? Are we ignoring the wealth of indigenous knowledge about how natural adaptations take place in the Australian landscape to our own peril. Um, and while carbon farming and resulting carbon credits have received a lot of attention, there's a lot of action around that at the moment, I, I fear we're just moving deck chairs on the Titanic um, and that the, the planet isn't actually benefiting by all the carbon credits we're selling, apart from a few aggregators getting immensely wealthy um, and no one else really benefiting. Um, because we, we're not actually helping the planet as much. Um, now, we've heard this term of regenerative agriculture, and when you look for definitions, do a bit, bit of a Google search, and you'll try and come up with definitions of regenerative agriculture, and you'll find very variable definitions. Some it's around soil health, some it's around whole of ecosystem health, some it's around um, holistic resource management. Um, until I came across the definition by uh, Lorraine Gordon, who's the director of the Regenerative Ag Centre at Southern Cross University, and it 
she has five principles that are all philosophical, not biophysical. And that really helped me understand, well, what is regenerative agriculture? It's by first and foremost taking a step back from our attitude towards the land saying, let's change the philosophy with which we approach, approach the land in the first place. Then the biophysical actions you take are more natural outcomes of that rather than us trying to define, well, is it about greater soil organic carbon, greater microbial biodiversity? No, it's not. It's a step back, look at the attitude you take to the land first and foremost. And so when you work with that, you then say it's the attitude we have towards country that actually is what we've got to change to see restoration take place. And we can understand why these terms like regenerative agriculture get traction with the next generation that come onto the land. Most of you would have been familiar with the term sustainability for the last 40, 50 years. I think we've rather burned the term. We, we've, we, we've really, you know, even the major agri agrochemical companies are calling themselves sustainable. Um, so what is sustainability? And, and also, if you think about the next generation of young people coming onto the land, they're looking at a degraded resource and they're saying, well, it's sustainability is like perpetual motion. We leave it like we found it. Whereas regenerative says we're going to make it, leave it better than we found it. So it has a better ring for the next generation that we, we're about restoring things, leaving them better for the next generation. Um, now, so you can understand where that narrative comes from. Um, <clears throat> now, to take a bit of a switch, we now see most multinational uh, agribusiness companies around the world um, setting targets for greenhouse gas emission reduction. So we've seen targets set by Unilever, Mondelez, Nestle, JBS, Heineken, Cargill. Heineken created a whole stir in Australia where they wanted only carbon neutral barley malt from Australia. And we were doing all these carbon audits and you discovered there's very few barley farm farmers that don't have sheep. So suddenly you've got methane thrown in the mix um, and it creates problems for carbon neutral barley malt apparently. Um, but now, Robin led the uh, Net Zero Australia plan and I was part of the land sector analysis. And one thing that really told me is that agriculture in its own right might struggle to meet its own supply chain targets by 2030 for reduced emissions by keeping all their carbon within the agricultural system. So this notion that there's all these spare carbon credits in agriculture um, that, that can meet the fossil fuel industry's requirement could actually not be true. In fact, if agriculture had to retain or inset all its carbon credits towards its own supply chain access, that's their first and foremost responsibility. Um, and so we started working with Climate Active, which is the National Carbon Offset Standard, on a, a way of an insetting framework for agriculture. So instead of having to generate ACCUs to achieve your carbon neutrality, farmers can keep their carbon in their soils and table it against their own farm balance. Um, I'm getting to biodiversity because um, when you look at the Australian uh, agricultural sustainability framework, so I was part of developing that, that framework for the National Farmers Federation and the um, Australian Farm Institute, it very quickly, it, it starts with sort of program one, two, three, which are all about soil carbon and soil health and, and greenhouse gas emissions. But straight after within the continuum is biodiversity. And so you can see that we're very rapidly moving in an ESG environmental services world out of carbon into biodiversity as the next metric of importance. And we've also started seeing these multinational agribusiness supply company, chain companies starting to set biodiversity targets as well. So I was in a meeting with Rabobank recently on the next large cohort of money coming out of Utrecht into the great the global south is tied to ESG performance around greenhouse gas emissions, water use efficiency and biodiversity. So clearly the agribusiness sector is, is going to have to take that on board. So we see this tr transition emerging where biodiversity is going to be the next big focus, but carbon a natural inset within biodiversity. So it raises the challenge is how do we plot a pathway out of this myopic focus on carbon into a more broader focus where farmers that have managed good biodiversity in the landscape are being rewarded for what they are achieving. Um, and um, but, but what's really important in the whole discussion comes to your presentation is, is how do we take a First Nations view of that? How do we bring in the traditional knowledge? How do we um, reintroduce diversification into the, the agricultural landscape? But I read on the Bush Heritage website about right, science, right way science. And I think that, that really describes how we've got to take the approach is to say, well, how can we combine traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge about the diversity required in the landscape, how to heal country, 
bring in Western science to provide the confidence that this is a pathway agriculture can take, bring those two together in that trust and respect framework to plot a pathway forward to a more resilient agricultural landscape that is more suited to the Australian landscape, where you can get the cultural values, you can get the, um, the biodiversity, but you can also get the food out of the landscape. And just to finish off, I, I, th I think we'd argue that if we had the First Nations view of uh, we don't own the land, the land owns us. We might have not destroyed the resource quite as much as, or tried to tame the resource as much as we did. And that's part of the philosophy that needs to change. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for rounding that out. Now, if I could ask the three of you to perhaps come here and sit down, and then we can maybe. Uh, have a discussion with, with people on on just some questions from from the floor. Um, so, just while you're thinking of who's putting their hand up first, I, I'm interested to know your views on how um, how confident you are that you'll be able to meld these two different approaches together successfully what what might be the biggest um impediments to being able to successfully meld the knowledge <laughs> um i overwhelm i have been overwhelmed consistently by the generosity of spirit from traditional owners across the country whenever we try and engage whenever we uh, um want to have a conversation so bush heritage does not ask aboriginal people if they want to partner with bush heritage we let people know what we're doing and, and then um, people approach us but in that conversation around what's important what do we have in common how can we help what are, does it make sense for us to partner the generosity of spirit is consistently overwhelming and i think that gives me an enormous sense of confidence and pride, I guess, in, in our nation and, 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 and an enormous potential for us to really go down a much more productive path than we have been. Um, and I do actually think uh, we've, we've not treated that with the appropriate level of respect in the past. And I think lots of knowledge has been subverted, lots of knowledge has been taken and used for you know, purposes that don't actually benefit the original knowledge holder in any way. And I think the lack of trust is probably one of the things that's going to stand in our way. And the other one is probably time. You know, whatever whatever awakening we have at the moment is a little bit late. <laughs> but that just means we have to, to work doubly hard to make it work. Yeah, I think it's about um, yeah, learning. Like, um, when I first started the first Bison's project, we did a bit of work around looking at principles, and one of the things we sort of worked and uh, come up with was around respect, um, recognition, um, reciprocity, responsibility. I think that's a big part of it. Like, I think people don't really understand that, um, I guess, that there's so much knowledge, cultural knowledge, in a lot of contemporary Western knowledge and practice these days. Like, the example I was talking about earlier is around a fire. So, you know, like first settlers came here, you know, they obviously knew how to make fires, um, but they didn't know about fire in a landscape. They didn't know about, you know, the way fire belonged to this country. And, and it was quite scary. And so that led to mainly suppression of fire. So there was a lot of suppression of fire, but in some areas, in some industries, like pastoralism and forestry, um, there was an acceptance of the role of fire. And where did that knowledge come from? It came from observation of our old people burning without relationships. And it came from... A lot of the, the workers, the, the, the um, stock, stockmen and the rig markers and, you know, all the, the old people that were indentured or, you know, worked in those industries and, and, and um, bought a lot of that knowledge. Um, and that became the basis of modern fire agencies and land management agencies. Where do their knowledge bases come from? They come out of those pathways. And so that recognition and respect for that knowledge. And so that's the challenge that we have is that, often what we do is we just sort of homogenize and we take and we take and we take and cultural knowledge systems are about reciprocity and about sharing and so it's about understanding that if we want to meld something we need to recognize what it is and we need to respect that and that's whatever the knowledge is it doesn't matter whether it's first aid is all knowledge 
we need to respect the source of that knowledge and we need to um, make sure that we use that knowledge in the right intent. And another example um, is um, around the technology. So, you know, old people didn't know how to um, make steel axe and maybe didn't need to learn how to make steel axe, but as soon as there was steel axe, it was like steel axe is pretty good. I like the steel axe. <laughs> um, you know, and so you can do a lot more damage with the steel axe than you can with the stone axe. And so part of this is about those protocols and philosophies. So, you know, like being able to understand that the, the danger of knowledge, like how, you know, we can turn, you know, something into something else and then something into something else. And suddenly we've lost our way. And where are we now? We're in a, we live in a world where we now control the climate. Like, let's not forget that. Like, we have created the scenario where we are actually in control regardless of the fact that we feel like we're out of control, we're actually in control. Humans make the decisions about how um, we do things and how that impacts on the planet. We can change that or we can continue to do the same. So understanding that, that you know, how do we use the knowledge? How does that knowledge fit our values? And that's what old people did. They made sure that we teach about the values and about kinship and about connection, our responsibility. Never take more than you need. You know, we learn country is our, is our mother. You know, and so you have to, yeah, pay respect and and honor and and then learn. And as you learn, you use the good knowledge. You know, so that's the where we come together. We we do things with there's new knowledge, new technology. We use it in the right way, in the right place, and that context is really important. I hate to take away from that because I I think that that that's excellent. So I'll I'll, I'll take a different angle. Um, I think we we we've had an unfortunate drive in agriculture to produce more volume at all costs yeah. and that's led to a degradation of the resource yeah. and there's some great reports around saying we need to shift out of a volume mentality into a value mentality yeah. and the moment we do that we can be more consistent with traditional value values in the landscape um, and, and so it requires a cultural shift in the way agriculture is viewed we've always had this view australia is the food bowl of asia well we're not the food bowl of anybody um, because if you think about the numbers, the, the world's middle class will go, we'll add an extra 3.4 billion people by 2030. If you double agriculture in Australia, we might feed 100 million. There's a couple of zeros missing in us being the food bowl of anybody. So we're about 0.1% of the food bowl of anyone, um, which, which could allow us to take a step back and say it's not about volume. It could be about value adding. In other words, the value of the land that from which we produce the food. And then that makes us more consistent with restoring the land and traditional values. So that I took a different angle. But... So if we build on from that though, um, what, what are your views about, so if we're talking about policy at the federal and state level, what do you think about the level of engagement or what might need to be done to have an impact on policy at state and federal level? <laughs> and, and and I can just add to that. So so do you think something like you know the voice having the the, the referendum on the voice uh, is an opportunity to have an impact, or is needs to be something completely separate? Over to you. But um, you know, definitely a lot of it is about governance, about how we make decisions, how we communicate, and. You know, I've had a, a you know a few interventions in that in that space, um, particularly through the, the cultural fire space, just trying to, I guess, change the way people think and just little things like when I worked for national parks, I was very excited about working national parks. I, was, I went to an Aboriginal pet ship program and I had this project called Fire Sticks, and I was like, we can do a lot of good stuff. And then I got into national parks and I was like, wow, you know, like we, we can't even do it in national parks that because we can't have our old people there and our young people. How do we maintain a cultural practice when the only people are allowed to be in the fire are all the firefighters, you know, mm -hmm. all the middle aged fire people, you know, instead of like what is the cultural process around our old people, you know, and knowledge holders showing our young people how to burn and maintaining a cultural practice into the future. And so that was like, to me, that was like the challenge was like, how do we actually just get started, you know? And so what we did is, you know, develop a policy. Um, that said that, yeah, that, that can happen. And there was all these rules and things that couldn't happen and all these policy constraints. And, you know, one of the key drivers of that was that, you know, National Parks had a bad um, incident where people lost their lives. If I got away, you know, seeing fire practitioners that people learned and were, you know, the people that they looked up to um, 
died, you know, um, including the former commissioner's father. So that impacted on how um, that agency made decisions. And so we do have real challenges about overcoming the legacies of mismanagement and people not having um, those foundational systems in place. And so it is it is super challenging, but yeah, like, you know, having, you know, a lot of my work has been about raising the voice of First Nations custodians, making sure that, you know, like we have a pathway so our young people um, and our old people can come together and we can show people, because in a lot of situations, you can't even demonstrate a lot of our cultural practices because we don't have access to land, we don't have access to resources. There's all these policies and legislation and, you know, stuff that's like in the way like that burnt it with um, Uncle Bruce, you know, like we broke the law that day um, in a way um, because, well, <laughs> but in a way we did um, because um, under the rules, there's all these things that you, you have to do, you know, but at the end of the day, we just deal with the test program, so it's fine, but like mm -hmm. nobody cares, <laughs> but, but if you break it down to the very, you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know what I mean? So there's, that's what we've had to do, like with the National Parks policy, lots of these policies, we've had to sort of show people what is this all about? This rule doesn't even make sense. We have rules that make sense. They're actually like, you know, like the authority of that day came from an elder saying, you know, can you demonstrate um, our practice? And so that law is more important, you know, and we didn't, you know, no damage was done. And so being able to kind of show um, those pathways, um, you know, is, is a challenging space, but if we don't do it, then we'll just always be moving backwards, we'll always be moving backwards and never moving forward. Yeah. I think to follow on from from that, thanks, all. I think that's that's perfect. And, I, and one of the things you're talking about there is inclusivity, like bringing people in and sharing the knowledge. And I think that is one of the greatest disappointments in the government system. And I don't just think Australia, in the new government system, the state is separated from the federal. And God forbid, this one state should do the same thing as another state in terms of their legislation and their the regulatory and legislative frameworks are all completely different. So many things fall through the cracks. But one of the things I think I'd like to expand the discussion around a little bit, land management is, is a lot, encompasses a lot of things, including how we develop towns and cities and where we where we put them. And, and all has heartbreakingly first-hand experience of managing a town in an area that's maybe not appropriate to have concrete or or roads and things that just maybe shouldn't be there and taking an, a much more inclusive approach to that planning in the first place and all of our planning all of our city planning all of our regional planning at the moment is done sector by sector and group by group so nobody has the opportunity to hear what the other people's knowledge is and what they can contribute and what the needs are and how we find a way forward. I, I actually have a modicum of hope that the current um, redo of the regional planning system is going to be much more inclusive. It's going to be, be about building a consensus of what is the goal? What is the overarching goal that we're going to see here? Have traditional owners in the same room as the miners and the developers and the community and conservationists and scientists and everybody so that we understand what this country needs, how we can work with it and how we grow the value, I love that, um, of everything that we're doing. We, we get what we need, not what we want. <laughs> and and we really grow through that in a, in a meaningful way. And I think that inclusivity is really important very personal opinion from from me this is not a bush heritage opinion i think the voice is crucial mm. i think it's not sufficient but i think it is an absolute base minimum when you're talking about people's country how can you say no that they shouldn't be included in that discussion and yes i hear around the, the need for regional voices i would trust a central group of Aboriginal people at a national level to make pathways to that much more than I would support the, the people that are in there right now. So I I would support that personally. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't take away from you then, because so again, <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of a jump to the left. Um, and, and, and that is, uh, 
if you've worked in the area of climate change in Australia, you become skeptical of politicians' ability to do much. Um, you, even um, I sit on the Victorian Climate Change Agriculture Council to the minister. We we're onto our fifth minister since we started the climate change. And you sort of run out of steam to retrain each minister as they come along. Um, so, but, but then you, so it makes you start looking for other opportunities to create the pressure somewhere else. And so, you know, it turns out I know the person in Unilever responsible for creating the metrics for ESG. They were at university with me. So, you know, meeting them in the UK recently, we were talking about, okay, so how do we create these metrics that then impose metrics down the supply chain to affect change that way? Because, you know, talking about why is agriculture risk, why is New Zealand facing a methane tax? Well, it's because Ontario set a target because Unilever set a target. And so you can affect a different change in agriculture through the supply chain because they're now starting to value biodiversity. Well, we're only one step away from getting them to value traditional knowledge in agriculture. Um, so you can affect quite a, quite a good change from that side, but not taking away from what you're talking about, but saying, where do I work? So maybe I go that side and we meet in the middle. Excellent. Maybe the biodiversity market or the nature property market. Yeah. Great meeting. Maybe. Okay. Now I'm very, very hopeless at being chair because we're on, we're sort of over time. But are there any <laughs> any any one one question or one question or what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this question, um, you know, bush, bush heritage documentation of baselines and subsequent biodiversity and appraisal of strategies adopted for the benefit of future generation. So, so what, what are we, so just interesting to, um, uh, on perhaps people's ability to be able to access documentation of, on what's happened so far and how if people are interested in being involved, how they might start to become involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a great time to ask that question because we're, if we haven't already, we're just about to publish 17 evaluation reports across a number of advocate reserves. And so that takes from the time that we bought the reserve to the current state, each of our individual targets, the health that they were when we bought it to where we are now, the status of each of the threats, what we've done to, to mitigate those threats, how much we've spent mitigating those threats, and what the ultimate income is, that outcome is. So there's there's a lot of information up on, they're called scorecards or evaluation reports, and they're all freely available on our website. And to, to be involved, um, obviously there's opportunities to, to donate, but there's also the opportunity to become a volunteer, and there's a, a volunteer portal on our website. So you can put in your, your skills and, and we match that with the appropriate things across country. I have to manage expectations though. We have a very elite cohort of volunteers who are exceptionally well trained. When I when I got this job, I was actually on the way to having a little bit of a break and I thought I'd go and work for Bush Heritage voluntarily and, and manage their reserves. And I was rejected as a volunteer. So <laughs> it's harder to get a job as a volunteer as it is than it is to get a job at Bush Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. On a very positive note, I, I'd like to uh, like to invite you to join with me in thanking our speakers for a really very enlightening and very interesting series of presentations and discussions this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just on a final note, I'd like to say our next presentation for uh, the Victoria for Victoria. Uh, it's going to be at the start of June with Kim Carr, who's our latest honorary fellow, and he's talking about the importance of effective communication of science. So thank you very much. Thank you.